Hey folks, Evil Pajamas here to help you get started playing Marvel Champions fast. Admittedly, the rule book and the rule reference together do have everything you need to know to play the game. However, I'll be helping you get started even quicker. The setup and play examples in this video will include pop-ups to the relevant sections of the rule book and rule reference, which should cut down the time that you need to get your game out of the box and start playing. If you already know how to set the game up, you can go ahead and skip to uh, 510 in the video to get to the actual game gameplay example. That said, I won't be going through every single rule and mechanic in the game, so you want to keep your rule reference handy, but this video should give you a good idea of how the turn order goes and how to set up your game. Now, as I mentioned, the core game comes with a rule book, the learn to play book, and a rule reference guide. The fastest way to get started is not to start with the learn to play guide, but to start with the rule reference guide and turn to Appendix 2 Setup. This should be somewhere between pages 19 and 22, depending on your version of the rule reference. The first thing you want to do when you're setting up is select your identity. The identity cards are two-sided, so make sure you're selecting the card with the Alter Ego label right here on the card. Then you'll need to set your hit points. Player hit point dials have the blue dials with the red face, and they are the smaller dials. If you're playing with more than one person, select the first player now. The first player token looks like this. Next, you should set aside your obligation card. The obligation card would have come with your other hero cards, except this particular card will have obligation shown here on the card. Next, you want to pull the Nemesis cards out from your player deck. All of the Nemesis cards will be labeled as Nemesis cards in the bottom left corner. The parenthetical number next to the Nemesis label will tell you how many of these cards you should have. You can double check to see that you got all the appropriate cards separated out by checking the backs. The Obligation and Nemesis cards should have orange backs that will match the back of the encounter deck. While the remaining player cards will have blue backs. Now shuffle your player deck. Next, set aside the tokens that are needed during gameplay. It should include damage counters, threat counters, all-purpose counters, and acceleration tokens. This should also include the status cards, tough status card, fuse status card, and stun status card. Next, select a villain. Start by looking at side 1A on this villain's main scheme. The contents section should tell you which villains to, se to select. The villain numbers will appear in the top right corner. Pick the ones that match the content section. The villain cards will have purple backs, unlike the encounter deck, which will have orange backs. Add the listed encounter deck to the villain decks. The name of the encounter set, along with the number of cards in that encounter set, are listed in the dot bottom left corner of the card. Set the villain HP dial to match the hit points total shown on the villain card. The symbol you see next to hit points indicates per player, so add this value multiplied by the number of players playing the game. Next, resolve the scheme setup on the main scheme written on side 1A. For Rhino, this will just say Advanced Stage 1B, which is on the back side of the card. Keep in mind that other villains might have actual instructions here besides flipping over the card. Here, for example, the 1A side of Ultron's main scheme card instructs you to retrieve a particular card from the Ultron deck and put it into play prior to flipping over the card to side 1B. 1B contains an additional instruction to take a card from the player deck for each player and engage, engage that card face down as a drone with the player. Next, take the obligation card that you set aside and shuffle it into the encounter deck that should be comprised now of all the sets indicated on the 1A side of the contents card, except for the actual villain cards. Now draw cards from your deck up to the hand size limit written on your alter ego side of your card. Review your hand and discard any number of cards that you want into your discard pile and then draw up again to your hand size limit. Don't shuffle the cards that you discarded back into the draw pile. If the identity you selected 
has any setup instruction, resolve these setup instructions now. Here, for instance, I'm playing for Black Panther. On the alter ego side of the card, T'Challa, it says during setup to search your deck for a Black Panther upgrade and add it to your hand and then shuffle your deck. This should be the last step in your setup and you should be ready to play. Thanks for watching so far. If you like this content and you'd like to see more content like this, please, please do hit like and hit subscribe. Uh, really does help out a small content creator like myself. Thanks so much. During their turn, a hero may perform any available options in any order. Keep in mind, the form of your identity, hero or alter ego, may impact whether or not certain actions may be taken. Here you can see I'm playing a card from my hand. This is a resource card, so there's no associated cost because the card only generates resources. If the card does have a cost, it would be where the red circle is on the picture. In the lower left, this is the resource that will be generated. Most cards do not require a specific type of resource, and any resource, as long as the total number is equal to the number in the upper left corner of the card, may be used to generate the amount of resource needed. In some instances, paying the cost with a specific resource type may make a difference in the effect of the card. In this case, the wild resource may be declared to be a specific resource type. This only applies when paying the cost of a card. It does not apply if a specified resource type is needed to trigger an ability. You don't have to specifically use a resource card to pay for cost. Any card may be used to generate resources. In this case, the power of protection card being played doubles the number of resources when paying for a green card, generating two resources rather than one. Here I'm playing an additional resource card, Strength, which generates two resources for any type of card. So here I want to play the Iron Fist. Or if you're a fan of the Netflix show, uh, Loris Tyrell. Circled in the upper left is the cost. Because this is a green card, Power Protection is generating two resources to pay for this card, while Strength generates two resources to pay for any card, bringing the total to four. If I were to pay more than the value of four from the cards I use to generate resources, that value cannot be carried over and it's lost. Below that, you can see that this is an ally type card. Allies come out into play in your play area next to your hero. In the green triangle on the right side of the card is the ally's HP total. When an ally conducts a basic attack or a basic thwart, typically most allies will suffer consequential damage. You can see the consequential damage counter pointed to by the red arrow. The number of these symbols will indicate how much damage your ally will take after completing the associated action. In the bottom left, you can see I've circled the resource that this card would generate if used to generate a resource to pay for another card or for anything else. Now, in some games, you'd have to wait to use an ally after you play them. In Marvel Champions, this isn't the case. You can immediately use your ally the same turn they are played. You see I'm playing a second ally here, so I won't go through again uh, how to play an ally. Just to note, this ally's text has a particular effect to put a toughness status card on him when he comes into play. That would be one of the three status cards that I showed that can affect the game. Uh, toughness, in, in particular, will negate the next damage taken by that character. Here I want to use the Iron Fist to do a basic attack action. Basic attacks exhaust the ally so you'll turn them 90 degrees. Characters are turned in this manner so that you know that they cannot be used again for another action that requires an exhaustion. The character attacking has a response option in his text. This is not a forced response option, so it is not required that this action be performed. The action does, however, have a triggering condition. In this case, the triggering condition is when Iron Fist attacks. But because Iron Fist attack is attacking here, I have the option to take one Mystic Counter off of him if there's one available. And in which case, the arrow indicates that's the cost, the one Mystic Counter. And in which case, I may stun the enemy and deal one damage to it. 
this is in addition to the two damage that Iron Fist will deal when attacking. So effectively, the the order of occurrence would be one damage plus stun, then another two damage from the attack. It's important to remember that these are separate occurrences of damage, the attack and the triggered condition response, because there are some cards that may interact with taking damage, or some effects that might interact with taking damage. So you might notice here that I'm not attacking with Luke Cage. And the reason for this is because when an ally attacks, if they have a consequential damage symbol, that will deal damage to him. In which case, his tough would be wasted on the one point of consequential damage. An identity may be changed forms once per turn. Here I'm opting to change forms from the initial starting Alter Eagle form to the Black Panther form and then using that form to do, conduct a basic attack. Once you've completed any of the available options that you wish to complete during your turn, your turn will be finished. If there are any other players in the game, they will take their turn, and then once all players have taken their turn, each pl all, all players will simultaneously discard their cards, draw up to their hand size limit, and then unexhaust their uh, their cards. After this is complete, you'll move to the villain phase. The first step of the villain phase is always to put threat on the main scheme. Threat is added to the main scheme on the number indicated on the card. It has a per player symbol, so add the number of threat per player to the card. Break in started with zero threat, and I'm playing solo, so one threat will be added to break in. You can see in the upper left corner of break in, the total amount of threat on a per player basis that would need to be generated on that scheme for players to lose the game. That's something that will appear on main scheme cards. Then the villain will activate. So it's important to remember that the villain is activating. You should consider that before just saying that the villain is attacking or scheming. For each hero, or I'm sorry, for each identity, depending on which form they're in, alter ego or hero, the villain will take two, one of two actions during their activation. For an identity that's in hero form, the villain will attack. Subsequently, any minions that are engaged with the hero will also attack. So admittedly, this is not the best tutorial example here, because in this case, Rhino is stunned. So he will activate, he will attempt to attack, but the stunned status will prevent him from attacking. So there will be no boost card assigned, and stun will be removed. Since there's no minions engaged with the hero here, then we move on to dealing one encounter card to each player. There's one player here, so one encounter card would be dealt. The encounter cards are placed face down in front of the player, and then all of a player's encounter cards are resolved um, in turn order. This particular encounter card has a win revealed effect, so the text on the card takes place uh, upon flipping the card over. So since that turn wasn't a good example, I am going to skip ahead to a different turn where there is a better example before ending this video so that you can see how the boost cards work. When attacked, the villain will draw one boost card from the top of the deck, and it will be placed face down. The player has an option to defend, either with an unexhausted ally or an unexhausted uh, identity in hero form. If more than one player is in the game, another player may opt to defend. The boost cards will work the same whether or not the villain is scheming or attacking. When the boost card is flipped over, add the number of boost icons to the villain's scheme or the villain's attack, depending on what action is taking place. If the villain has any attachments that also modify these numbers, make sure that you also add that. Sometimes, instead of the boost icon, you'll see a star. The star indicates that there is some text on the card 
that should take precedence rather than adding a value to boost. So hopefully this will help you get started. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of things that are left that you go over in the rule manual. Um, so if you have questions as you go through a playthrough, I uh, would recommend referencing the rules. If you liked this video, please click like. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please hit subscribe.